All right. We are here at the D4 Tabletop Creative Conference playtesting panel. I am very excited to have an incredible group of folks here to help uh, to teach us all about playtesting, to learn, share knowledge, uh, and of hopefully some uh, useful stories, including at least a few embarrassing ones that I know of uh, about playtests gone wrong to keep things exciting. Uh, so uh, why don't we start off with some introductions? Uh, Peter, you wanna kick us off and uh, tell us who you are and why uh, we should listen to you about playtesting. Hey, uh, sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Peter Vaughn here. I am a publisher and developer of board games. I think I've collaborated on about 36 projects. And to do that, you need a lot of testing. So I've had all sorts of, you know, uh, big groups, small groups, uh, testing that has gone right and wrong, and you got to bang on these games to get them all finished. Great. Nicole, how about you? Let us, let us know a little bit about your expertise. Yeah, thanks for having me. So uh, I'm Nicole Jekic. I am a games producer and developer at Funko Games uh, and have been so for the past uh, three years. And I also come from a background of uh, an event coordinator over at Playtest Northwest, which is kind of a Seattle-based uh, playtesting group of indie designers. It's kind of where uh, I got my start about five years ago uh, and kind of you know, moved that, uh, did that transition to the corporate world, I guess. Uh, so I have experience to share from uh, kind of both, uh, both kind of playtesting groups. Great, love it. All right, Jay, you're up next. I'm Jay Cormier. I've uh, designed a, uh, around 20-ish games or so. Uh, that a lot of them are behind me here, showing them off, of course. And uh, I've recently started my own uh, publishing company, Off the Page Games, and uh, got my first game coming out. And uh, I also uh, designed and created the Fail Faster Playtesting Journal, which we can uh, talk or not talk about later on. I don't think that's going to be relevant to the conversation. I, yeah, We're I just going to move on. <laughs> We're just going to move on. Julie, <laughs> why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Julie Ahern. I'm the vice president of Greenbrier Games, one of the co-founders. Uh, my start in board games was actually in the education where I designed dozens of educational games for various school districts. And then uh, had Jeff made the mistake of asking me to help him design our first game, which segued into us starting a company. Uh, we've been around since 2012 and uh, did design and co-designed a couple of the games there. And I'm also on the board for Gamma and work with the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund and do some other stuff. So yeah, um, I've run a lot of play test, for play test sessions for both education and for funsies. Fantastic. Playtesting for funsies. Uh, you know it. <laughs> um, great. And uh, just so uh, people will know, I am Justin Gary. Uh, I am uh, moderating this panel. I've had a few games I have playtested myself, uh, CEO of Stoneblade Entertainment and Gamer Entertainment. I have designed games for Marvel, DC, World of Warcraft. I've created the most recent edition of Bakugan, Ascension, a variety of others. And I've had many embarrassing playtest sessions uh, that I am happy to share stories from and avoid the embarrassments from y'all. Uh, so that the people listening can learn a little bit easier than, than we did. So, uh, uh, and that's kind of where I want to kick things off. I've, I've prompted it enough. And I, I, do, I do think that there's always these, these moments, these somewhat painful, but really illustrative playtest sessions, especially when you're first getting started that teach you something valuable. And I was wondering if anybody wants to be brave enough to share uh, one of those moments and lessons uh, to kick off the panel. Yeah, yeah. sure, I'll raise, yeah, raise my hand, it. I guess. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, I wanted to share a little bit about when we tested Groundhog Day, uh, because one of the one of the great things about uh, our play testing when we were doing it in person for Funko is we have this really great like observational room with like a one way mirror, which makes it really good to kind of like let you as the designer or producer kind of like step back and just watch people play your game and kind of naturally uh, you know go through the rule book, uh, make mistakes, and you can kind of see where the the pain points are uh, in your game. And with Groundhog Day, it's a game that doesn't have like your typical like turn structure or this player starts and then goes through and does these things and then it's passed along. Uh, there's basically just a lot of like pass fail kind of things that happen uh, within a round. And we didn't really know how exactly we wanted to explain that in the rules. So we kind of like left a rule book very kind of open for people to test. And so it was 
uh, definitely a, a little bit uncomfortable because we we had the you know this is the objective how you win and, and you could totally tell that there were like five people out of the six player group that totally got it but you had one person that basically kept playing you know you would call it maybe the wrong card or the wrong strategy but I actually learned a lot from what that person's like pain points were in the game uh, and what was what I also really like is when you get other people explaining the strategy of your game to other players. It's, uh, you know, it, it gives you the opportunity to basically like write down like, oh, that's a good thing of how to like explain that, uh, this part of the game, you know, where and it eventually led to basically us having a section in the rules where here are the good card play tips um, and some good things to follow that we kind of learned from, from uh, observing this play test. Great. Yeah. So, so taking some, some principles underlined there. So that idea of like listening to what your playtesters say and sometimes using their exact language and the types of things that they explain and the way they explain it is a great thing to help inform your full rule books. And I also, uh, I share, uh, I want to empathize with the one-way mirror play tests. It's the best thing. If you could do it, it's phenomenal, but it is so painful to be on the other side of it. We did that with our uh, Bakugan game and you see these kids like playing the game that you think the rules are very clear and they are not listening to them at all. They are not following them at all. And and then the hardest lesson there is it's not their fault. It's always your fault, right? You have to realize that if they're, they're not going to, a lot of things that you take as intuitive are going to just be lost uh, unless you are able to explain them in a way that they can actually hear. So that's a great, yeah, exactly a great, a great story. A great, some, some great lessons there. Uh, anybody else want to jump I in? I can follow the, yeah. I can follow the take their exact words bit with, with, a, with a story. Um, so we were developing a game called Rise of Tribes. And in Rise of Tribes, we had this fun new dice mechanic where you roll dice and you get a result and you get to, where there's a set of dice, you, you take a die and you push into the die and then you, one pops out the other end and then the dice that are left is your power. And where we go through the play test and someone says at the end of the game, I don't like dice. I don't think it should be dice. And it's like, it's like you hear the, you hear like, this is the main thing. I don't think it should be dice. And so one lesson I learned is, is that, uh, but later talking to them, it was more like they had too many dice and there were too many actions. So, so you don't take their literal words of, I hate dice because they were, unless, unless it's everyone who's saying that, but if it's one person, you just have to get to the kernel of what is in that feedback. Like, what is it about that, that is making them say that comment and then nod and say, sure, we'll we th we'll think about that. But of course we're still doing dice. I hate to tell you, like, yeah. that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I love that, 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 that idea of, you know, getting behind the words, right? Like, because a lot of times play treasures will tell you one thing, but in reality, what's going on is something that's deeper, right? Or there's, a, there's another way to address that. And, and, and the skill of getting good at knowing when to listen to their words and when to listen to, you know, their actions or to dig deeper is a really, is a really interesting one. It will be worth us uh, digging more into like how you develop that intuition. Well, uh, I actually, I had to call out a designer during a play test where a different play tester was giving feedback, but the feedback they chose to give was a solution. They said, you should do this. And the designer unfortunately got defensive and I'm watching how this is playing out. And eventually I took the designer aside. I said, hey, listen, that feedback you're getting, they don't know how to give feedback. You know, they're just play testing. They're saying, it would be great if you had this. Try to find what is the what is the what are they trying to solve? What is the problem they're trying to solve? And then try to figure out what that is. And if you don't know, if you can't figure it out, ask them. But if you can't figure it out, then you as a designer figure out a way to solve that. It doesn't have to be their solution, but maybe there's something else that they're trying to solve. Uh, uh, and, and it'd be better for you to identify the problem. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And, and this ties into actually one of my favorite quotes from my favorite author, uh, Neil Gaiman, who is specifically talking about writing, uh, but it applies to game design just as well. That when your audience, when your reader tells you that you, uh, something is wrong, they're almost always right. And when they tell you how to fix it, they're almost always wrong, right? <laughs> that if enough people are giving you feedback about your game, that there's something wrong, you absolutely have a problem. But what they tell you about right. how to fix it is almost always a disaster. And so your job as the designer is, the, is, to, is to parse what is causing them to feel the way they're feeling and, and to fix it that way. So it's, it's another great piece of insight. Um, so back when I was in college, uh, I was a theater major because that worked out well. But <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I took a directing course and the first month of, first month, of the entire course, uh, the professor had us, he's like, okay, Hamlet, everybody's in their, 
Everybody knows Hamlet. We all know Hamlet. Great. Um, okay, you're going to be writers and you're going to rewrite Hamlet. You get two pages and two actors and you can do it. It needs to be in under 10 minutes. Bring it back tomorrow. And then we turned them in and he was like, great. Now you're going to be a director and you're going to be a director of this one. You're going to be a director, cast it in this group and now act and everybody has to act Hamlet. See you tomorrow. And he did this with rotations over and over and iterations and iterations, four pages, four actors, one actor, five pages for a month. And you had to sit there when somebody was acting out your Shakespeare and take it and watch it. And every time as a the writer of that version would be like, no, no, but he would yell, Shakespeare is dead. <laughs> and I kept that kernel. <laughs> So that when we were play testing our first games, Apocalypse, and it's a big sandboxy and it's messy and it was even messier before we got to the final iteration. And it was meant to be, you know, a Meritrash, uh, but that also leaves a lot of open-ended questions and, and a, lot of, a lot of feedback. And the first couple times we had play test sessions, people would start talking and I would do exactly what Jay was talking about and start to get defensive. And then sometimes I would cry and that was super embarrassing and totally not helpful to anybody involved. And so I, I know that I had to use until I got a thicker skin, I had to make questionnaires to ask what I wanted so that I could be like, hey, I would love to hear what you had to say, but I'd really rather you write it down if you're able to, because I could go back to my office and yell at a piece of paper because that piece of paper did not care. Didn't care. Yeah. It, zero <laughs> cares in the world about what mm -hmm. it was saying. And if one paper said it, if 15 papers say it, said it, I could cry all I wanted. But at the end of the day, those 15 papers told me that after I got over my feels, something had to be changed. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that and, and sharing the, the vulnerability there, because I think that's the, the one underlying thing about play tests. Like we could, we're going to talk a lot about, I think, specific tips and tricks and how to run a play test and how to get the most out of a play test. But in reality, a lot of it is just dealing with that emotional challenge, right? If you're putting your baby onto the table that you think is great, you think it's this amazing thing, and you're going to have people basically tell you it's garbage, right? That's that's part of the process. In fact, it's what well, you're looking for. I mean, to for. be fair, those early iterations really were. They were garbage. <laughs> yes, they oh, were 100%. Right. Yeah, you know? no, and, and, and that's, and it's just that ability to, to know that you're going to come and face that kind of criticism and face that kind of challenge over and over again and being able emotionally to be prepared for that and ready for that, I think is, in my opinion, maybe the most important part of playtesting, right? Like all of the specifics after that that we're going to cover are just, if you're not willing to do that, then what's going to happen is you either won't put your game out for playtesting, you will be defensive and not listen to feedback, or you'll just, you know, you'll quit or you'll just not, you know, not listen at all. And, and so I think it's just really important that, and, and, and I mean, I'll, not speaking for you, but I know I still feel that when I bring new games to the table, even after doing this for 20 years, you know, and so- I mean, it yeah. Go ahead, Peter. I was gonna say you can not listen, but then who who the people who are buying at a target or someone will someone will say it still later, you know. Yeah. If you don't listen to it. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If yeah you're better not, to hear it early. Right. Yeah. If you're not comfortable with criticism, don't be a game designer. Because <laughs> I think one of the strangest I had a designer come up to me at a convention and say, uh, and it was a small one, so you know, I could take all the time in the world, but after a while I really wish I hadn't, because he would he he said I've made this game and I've tried play testing it with other people, but they didn't seem to understand the point of it. So I stopped and I just created a pro computer program to do iterations to make sure the game works. So I know it's good. No. <laughs> right. And I was just like, I, I could spend the whole convention unpacking that for you, but you're clearly already mm. are not going to get it. Yeah. So thank you, but I am not interested in looking at the game. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think it's I think it's only fair. I'm going to share one story of my own, and then and then we'll start digging into some other topics here because I uh, I I <laughs> so I was working on my game Ascension back back when I was first starting up my company, and I had this you know it's a deck building game with the center row that's like always changing. That was like the heart of the game, and I had this really cool mechanic where the row would move like a conveyor belt and like knock the last card off the end, a new card would show up because I was really worried about the row getting stuck, and there were all these cool mechanics to play with it, and I was just in love 
with this mechanic. And every time there was a play test, people would mess it up and I would have to remind them, oh, by the way, move the thing down. You got to get rid of the thing, right? And I just, they would forget it. I would remind them like, oh, this is really cool. And then finally, one of the players was like, what if we just didn't do that? I had to have one <laughs> play testers actually had to tell me, like, what if we just didn't do that? <laughs> I was like, uh, okay. And we tried it and the game was instantly better instantly better and and so it was embarrassing because i didn't even think to do that before they mentioned it but there's two two lessons i took from that right one is uh when in doubt cut things before you add things right mm -hmm. is generally a good rule of thumb and uh whenever player instincts whenever possible make player instincts correct if you see players consistently making the same kind of mistake rather than try to correct them see if you can correct your game to make that not a mistake anymore um so those were uh, some valuable lessons I've stuck uh, stuck with me uh, as well. So there's there's a lot of great stuff here, uh, and so I think uh, I want to just kind of walk us through some of the process because I think for a lot of people, there's a mystery around playtesting or there's this challenge from the starting from the very beginning, which is like how do I find playtesters, right? What do you what? So for tips for you guys, either now or or in the past, what's your best tips, tricks, tactics? when it comes to finding people, recruiting people to come and play your games? How do you get people to play? How do you get the right people? What's the, what's the best way for people to think about this? I'll say my, my uh, go-to strategy is uh, to form a group of, of like-minded game designers in your community, in your area. If you can find other game designers that are in your area that maybe can meet up at a local game store uh, once you know game stores are open again and whatnot, um that uh, that to me is the biggest thing because playtesting with uh, game designers is is on a different level to me and it's uh, not necessarily more valuable or less valuable than playtesting with non-game designers but there's definitely um uh different types of feedback you get with game designers and uh then you also get to play test their games because obviously you're kind of giving and taking and play testing other people's games is also valuable as a designer to learn uh and see other people's uh games and how they come and it helps with you with your ability to give feedback but that's probably the biggest thing is try to find other game designers uh in your area and try to form groups um so you can share play tests it's interesting that you say game designers i think i usually have a mix of two to one i, I usually do have game designers because you are you sort of see a lot of influx of ideas that way, but I I love having someone who doesn't make games come in and see what the heck's going on. If they can understand, especially when you get to the testing of rule book situations and you're, you just want someone to come in and, and absorb it. Um, so, but I, but I was gonna say, just to add, I used Meetup a lot, which, you know, in order to find play testers, um, you know, there's obviously there's the board game cafes and, and there's the board game stores in your area, but meetup is a good, it was, a, it was a good cross section. That's how I some, sometimes got that two to one is that people who type in, like, I just want to, I just want to find something. What I learned with meetup is, is that a really good image and a really good description of what we were going to do would different groups, you know, so I could, I could get the, the Euro, like a really crunchy game. It was going to take three hours. If I said this was going to take a while, I would get certain players. And then if I said, Hey, we're going to laugh and have pizza and have beer, and we're going to test this party game, it would get other players to come and And then meetup would, would largely serve both types, which is actually, was great. Yeah. I'll second that with meetup uh, for Playtest Northwest. We kind of used that exclusively prior to uh, pandemic stuff. And then we kind of did a little bit of that and discord. Uh, but Meetup was kind of where we uh, encouraged designers to kind of like share the games that they were testing uh, to kind of like basically draw interest and that would uh, eventually kind of bring people to the tables. You know, it, it was easier to get people, like you mentioned, if you had like an attractive image of kind of what was going on, but then also a description of what kind of games they can expect and, you know, how long it takes and things like that. Uh, that, that really helped with kind of getting people to, to come out to the stores to actually play, play your game. So I like that because we're also kind of talking about what kind of a play tester you're looking for. So the meeting with other designers local to you is, is going to get one type of play test. Meetup is going to give you a very different, for me, the kind of in between that I have used um, is when I'm at, a, and of course this year, not so much, but at a convention when I'm talking to somebody and they are very excited about whatever they've played, they play tested, you know, it's always a follow-up. Do you want to sign up for our newsletter or any any advance? Yes, I do. And they sign up. And if they've been excited and they're enthusiastically writing down their email, I draw a little unicorn next to their email. 
actress. <laughs> that is the indicator of, hey, friend, you seemed more excited than regular. Would you like to, like, to be part of our special group? And cool. I've never gotten a no. Uh, yeah. You know, it's a pretty good gauge. Uh, and that is my in-between. So somebody who's a more experienced gamer, but who's very knowledgeable about my games. So I know that it's the genre is interesting to them, all of that. And I'm not going to have to filter out the, you know, what type of game uh, do you like dice or not? <laughs> that type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of value that it, it speaks to that fundamental question, right? You want the right type of people to be play testing your game. Right. Right. And if they're not interested in your game, they're not part of your target audience. And, you know, you could still get some useful feedback from them, but it's not going to be nearly as useful as people who for sure are your target audience that like the kinds of games that you're making. Right. That reminds me too. I used to run these events that were like an all day thing. And what we would do is we'd ask a designer to take a certain slot, like two o'clock, you're at this table. And, you know, t and two o'clock, there's another table. And what I would have is I have the designers um, stand up and say a little bit about what their game is but i would also print a menu that when you come in at the beginning of the event you get to see what is coming what's what's you know what what games are going to be on the table all day and that way you can really like during a break or a slow period you can read through that and go oh there's one like at two o'clock that is exactly what i want tends to get the people to head to the table they want doesn't always work but you know sometimes if the descriptions are good yeah yeah. And then, and I, you know, I had a lot of similar stories for how I would get people to play test back when, back in the before times. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but I was forced to adapt as, as I'm sure we all were in, in, in the COVID era and be doing a lot more play testing through discord and through things like tabletop simulator. And honestly, I, I don't know if you guys have a similar experience, but to me, it's, it's gotten largely just enormously better, right? Not only do we have our Stoneblade Discord where people can come and play test our games, but I also created, I think like a game designer masterclass kind of Discord, which was all game design students and people who wanted to learn. And that allowed them to find each other and play and play test with people from all over the world. And the caliber of feedback, the amount of people that you could get to play test just jumped through the roof, like far greater than anything I had pre-COVID pre where I would wait for conventions or only get together with a local group once a week. Um, and so I don't know if you guys have similar experiences or, or maybe best practices for people that are stuck at home or maybe just want to take advantage of the fact that, hey, maybe they're in a rural area and don't have a local game design community. How can they best look to find playtesters and get the most out of that? Yeah, I guess I'll say that uh, I, I've definitely noticed that and with uh, the community that I run, but then also uh, at work and then other uh, kind of discord communities I'm part of, you just kind of have like a much better return on like the time that you invest uh, in kind of when you're on these uh, digital spaces uh, to get your game tested much more than what would happen when we, you'd have to, you know, organize the in-person events or conventions that would only pop up, you know, every couple months or so. Um, and one of the other things I'll, I'll, I'll uh, bring up for the kind of mass market audience that a lot of times we, we make games for is the uh, the sudden uh, wonder that uh, even if for people that are the mass market audience and go play a lot of games that don't have access or, or use like tabletop simulator, um, they all know how to use Zoom now because of schools and their own work. Uh, and so we've been able to kind of bring that one way mirror testing uh, to kind of like a Zoom observational test. Uh, that is uh, when we're testing with mass market is largely what we what we kind of do is we either send out the game or drop it off if they're local uh, and then set up kind of like a, a Zoom meeting where we can either teach them through the game if it's really early stages or kind of let them, you know, uh, out of box and, and open it up and and us kind of like put ourselves on, on mute and uh, video off and just kind of watch the experience cool. happen. Cool that's idea. Cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. So, so just I want to actually just dig in because this is this is fascinating. I think everybody in the panel is fascinated. Uh, it, it's it you'll you'll this is usually I assume for kids and, and mass market audiences. You you you'll they'll agree ahead of time. You send them the materials. You they set up a camera so you could watch them, and then you're either giving them instructions or you're just letting them play, and you're just you're just able to watch and get that kind of feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I've noticed uh, other people in the indie community doing that as well, you know, for, to a lesser degree, because you do obviously have to coordinate a lot of stuff. You have to have the, uh, the, the play testers kind of already kind of, uh, you know, agreed to jump into that. Um, I think one of the advantages uh, that Funko Games has is because we were previously the, the Boris Cruzan studio, 
um, which I, you know, I'm, I'm since I'm a kind of a newbie here too, uh, you know, it has like a like a 20 year history. So it has like, a, like, a, essentially like a really large database of testers to pull from. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's constantly growing, because we're constantly trying to find more people, um, you know, outside of our circles and get recommendations. But we were we were lucky in that aspect that once people went home, um, you know, people were also really receptive to play games um, uh, via this method because uh, we didn't realize like how much that actually, um, like how much it was for people to have to like get their kids in a car, go to our like uh, studio, you know, uh, get their kids to like sit in the room and like play the game and like stay focused on it. Um, and there were just a lot of barriers that we didn't really realize were barriers once we kind of allowed people to, to test things in their own home. You know, there's, there's still things about it, it being in your own home. Like we, I've totally had sessions where kids just got up and like left. They're like, oh, TV's on or movie's on or, hey, I'm going to go do this other thing. And you're just like, well, okay, well, that happens. <laughs> um, but there's been a lot of advantages, I think, of, of doing these kinds of, uh, these kinds of uh, play testing methods. Great. So, um, all right, so we've done a good job of recovering how do you find people, whether that be virtually in person um, or creeping on them with a the camera when they don't see you. Uh, but uh, we have uh, now, let's shift topics a little bit to, to what makes a useful play test session, right? How do, you, how do you get good feedback? How do you maximize the time that you have with somebody when they're there and they're play testing your game? I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and kick it off uh, since there's a, with, with a brief pause here, because the thing that I found to be most important is that you've got to be very clear that every time I prototype, every time I set up a play test, I'm trying to answer some very specific questions, right? To be very clear about what is it that I want to know right now, right? If I'm very early in the process, it could be something as broad as like, is this any fun, right? What's actually, what's the core about this? Or if it goes later, it could be, you know, more things like, hey, are people engaging with this type of strategy in the game? Are they interacting with this cards? Or can they figure out the rules without me watching, right? Each phase, if I, I'm not trying to see if they can figure out the rules when it's very, very early. I don't mind explaining those things because that's not part of it. But also if I haven't already found the fun by the time I'm trying to teach the rules, then there's a different kind of problem, right? And so being very clear with the question I want to answer. And I know that Julie already mentioned the idea of having a questionnaire potentially that actually has some of those questions on it to help funnel feedback. I found those to be both very useful tools to help kind of drive each play test and make sure I'm getting what I need out of it. Yeah, so, and that, is something I've learned over time. At the very beginning, my questionnaires were very open-ended and had all the questions all at once, which means people are going to write all the answers or be very non, like any of the, they're going to be short and non-committal or they're going to be uh, like uh, our number one play tester who still is to this day. And he basically played six hours, like closed the ask the owner apparently he had, was at that game store all the time he's like hey i'll just close up when we're done if you want to just pick up the stuff when we're done and filled out five pages which was overwhelming um but useful <laughs> which is why we kept him around um and to your point but knowing that so when you're doing a questionnaire knowing what you want the answers to be and writing a is it starts becoming a, a thing of do you know how to write ask a question that's going to get you the answers you're looking for. Do you, is it, are you writing yes or no questions? Are you writing specifically for a targeted goal and focus without leading them to the answer is, and, is and also to, a challenge. And to underline what you're saying there, Julie, I would say just writing um, notes is important. And, and I think I've, I've played tested with some newer designers and it gets to feedback time um, and feedback is, is given. And I see them not taking notes and I actually will, I'll call them out on like, Hey, do you want, would you want, should we wait while you get a piece of paper and a pen to write this down? Cause this is important. Cause I, I, I want to make sure that when I'm playtesting with other people and other designers that they understand that there's a lot of respect you're showing when you're taking notes. When you take notes, it shows that I respect your ideas. You don't have to agree with everybody's ideas, but you have to write them all down and listen to them and accept them as ideas. 
and take them down and show that like your ideas in, in your input and your feedback. And the reason why I'm play testing right now is to get this input and this feedback is valuable to me. And I want to write it down so that I remember it. And that's so important that people write things down as they're playing and watching and writing down things like all oh, the questions people ask and the mood and the, and the body language, all that kind of stuff. But when you get to the actual feedback, writing everything down, don't think, oh, I'll remember this. That's a good tip. Yeah, I'll remember that. You, you won't. And it shows disrespect to your play testers. Correct. 100%. I have um, I have two things on this, which is that I started to do sort of a, a feedback form that was a lot of fill, you know, like long long answer, right? And I ran into a video game designer who was doing one that was all multiple choice checkbox, like really like scale of one to five kind of stuff. And I realized actually that a good hybrid is 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 possibly the best answer because you get them started with you know, fun and, and player agency, but like on scales. So you kind of, you ground them in some easy questions. And then maybe the bottom of the form is let's talk about the strengths and the weaknesses or other comments you have, but keep it not, not too long so that they don't feel like they've just done this huge effort to, you know, go through it. But then also I think when we get to a group that's played a game more than once, I drop the form and I do more of an audio. I just hit record because they're, Usually those people are pursuing like the bigger strategies and they want to talk about what didn't work and so forth. And I sort of take the form out of it. But in that case, I'm writing notes, like Jay said, I'm still, I'm still writing, but they're okay, not and, writing. And you have to be mindful because it, it might be bigger st strategies or it might be uh, you're play testing with kids and you don't, whatever the reason might be, you want to be respectful if somebody can't or doesn't have the capacity to, to do the writing that you're still sure. valuing their input their input of what they, their experiences what was if they want to share it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're gonna end up custom tailoring these sorts of things a lot as you go. Like there are some questions that I ask all the time and I love the kind of one to five, you know, on a, you know, on a scale of one to five, how much, you know, how likely are you to recommend this game to somebody else or how easy was this game to learn? Like those kinds of things, forcing people into numbers can be very meaningful and give you trends over time, which can also be really valuable to track as well as forcing questions, things like if you could change one thing about this game, what would you change? Right. Or yeah. is, you know, if there was, you know, in your own, what, you know, what, 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 if you, if you want to make sure that one thing doesn't change about this game, what wouldn't, you know, what would you want <laughs> to say, right. Those things are just force people to give something concrete, especially when it comes to negative stuff, right. What was the most confusing yeah. thing of the, about the game, right. Those kinds of questions really help. And for, for anybody that, you know, is hopefully frantically taking notes as they're uh, reading this, you can also, I actually have a whole list of questionnaires, sample questionnaire you could download um, think like game designer.com slash media. It's a, good starting point for anybody if you just want to have a questionnaire um, for free that you could just kind of use as a starting point for people that are listening. I think one challenge with people that play that are new designers that they have is that they're most of their play testers are going to be their friends and their family. And I think oftentimes when you play just with your friends and family, you're going to get a lot of glad handing and a lot of like, this is really cool, really good. Yeah. Really good game. Really <laughs> neat. Good job. Yeah. Wow. And that's yeah, like that's a skewed Mom. feedback. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So My, yeah, that's great. Two two, th two things that I've used in the past that I have worked is one is a question similar to some of the ones you guys have said is that um, what what is something that would make this game five percent better? And what that does is it turns talking about something negative which people sometimes have a hard time when you're related or friends to you to turning it into a, a, a solution and like. Oh, well, I guess it would be cool if we had more of this. I'm like, great, then you're, you're off on a, a path. And the other thing I do is if sometimes um, I, I design a lot of games. So I do, when, when I have a play test session, I sometimes would play test three or four games in a night with my friends. And then I would always ask at the end of the night, I said, if I had to invest $50,000 of my own money into one of those games, which one should I focus on more? And that often gives me a little guidance as far as which one uh, is the most ready or the most market ready in their eyes. And, and, and I, I, that's worked well for me. That's a good one. I'm gonna write that down. Yeah. That's a good one. Other, <laughs> yeah. One other thing to say about how to get a success out of a play test, I hate to say like strict organization because you do want to have looseness, but but I feel like uh, some games people will keep playing for a long time when they really should learn how to test either the middle or the end part of the game or know how to cut it off and take feedback for what they have gotten. And then if you do, if you make a structure to the game night, you also tell people when the picks are going to be uh, that this session is only going to be two hours and that we're going to change. And I feel like that kind of stuff also helps ground people in like, 
what should I be expecting? I'm only going to do one hour and then we're going to switch it up. Because if you let it go, designers will go long and they will talk too much and then the games will go. The people will be like, please save me from this table. I can't, I can't yeah. be here. Oh, the biggest thing is stop your play test. I can't, I say this so much to new designers is like, when you're not going to get any more information out of this play test, because maybe the game is so broken and you can't fix it on the fly, or it's just too repetitive. It's the same thing for the next seven rounds. Just stop the play test, respect your play testers time and go away. And then let's, let's move on to something else. Cause that's, that's gold. That time is gold yeah. for everybody. Well, and, and in fact, I think there's another level to this too, which is you should be also planning play tests that aren't going through the whole thing, right? A lot of times you could plan a couple of turns of a game that will teach you everything that you need to know. And, and when it comes to, you know, play testing, like fast time to iterate and get through it and get to the next, playtest is the name of the game so everything you can do to shorten that window yes. is is gold i mean it's so important and, and so I, I just want to underscore that yeah absolutely if a game has gone off the rails or if you've learned what you need to learn stop and also when you're even before you get to that session think what's the minimum amount that i can do here to learn what i need to learn uh and it says your, your playtesters will thank you and you will gain so much more value out of it because you could run more sessions or other games or just you know get back to iterating um, yeah, it's it's I, I love everything that people are saying here as far as respecting the, your play play testers time and other designers who are play testing your games time because uh, I've, I've noticed that that is kind of what has been very successful in a lot of these discord play tests, especially when you have a game that's like, Ugh, it's like an hour and a half game, you know, we have like a two hour tight time limit. You know, uh, we kind of make sure that people at the table know to be like, okay, hey, just letting you know time check like this is where we're at. Um, because if you, you know, keep people longer than their expectation, you're going to have these basically people who don't want to come back because they were like, oh, well, I don't want that to happen again, or that took too long. And, you know, you just kind of make it a more of a, a, a welcoming uh, place for people that way. Great. So, uh, so let's transition a little forward in the process, right? We've talked about how do we get play testers? How do we schedule a session? How do we take in uh, feedback and gather useful feedback. So now I got that feedback and now let's talk about how do, how do I use it, right? What's the best way to process? Maybe I got a bunch of papers and I'm gonna cry over it, right? Of the feedback I got, that may be part of the process and it totally is sometimes. Um, but, but what do you do when you sort of get this kind of things? Maybe sometimes it's a little bit muddled, maybe sometimes it's overwhelmingly negative, maybe sometimes it's overwhelmingly positive. How do you process this kind of feedback when you get it? Uh, I think, yeah, if you've asked specific questions, even if it's overwhelmingly negative, you should be getting specific answers. So then you know what you're working on, whether it's that, yeah, whether it's the, the card sliding mechanism, which by the way, I love, I, I don't, I'm just going to say, um, <laughs> as, a, as an action choice, uh, but, <laughs> but what, you know, so what are you should have a list of and again you're not going to necessarily listen to all the solutions that people have thoughtfully brought to your attention but you should be able to ask yourself okay so this this clearly didn't work what in my brain are the two to five things i'm going to try as alternatives that i know my game i know what's going to fit here i know what's going to feel right in this game and how quickly and how quickly can I go through them to make sure I'm on the right path? To me, that is literally the most exciting part of being a game designer. It is absolutely no matter you, you, everyone goes to the to their play test thinking this is the best game of all time. I can't I can't wait to show you this. You're, everyone's going to love it, and they're going to be like, "How much can I pay to take this prototype?" Because I want to play with my friends right now. And invariably, that's not true. Uh, and so. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's not true. And as much as we want people to be like cheering at the end of it and saying how amazing it is in, in our heads, to me, as good as I thought the game was, after going through the playtest and seeing things get broken and, see, and talking about solutions and figuring and asking questions to navigate me through a way where I'm going to be able to make it even better. Oh my God, I'm even more excited now. I thought this game was amazing. Now it's going to be even better. This, I'm so excited. Can't wait to go home, start working on the, the, the revisions right away. Very excited. Well, that is uh, that's a very positive attitude to have. I think, <laughs> I think that may be easier said than for a lot of people, but it is the right way to go. They the being learning to be excited 
to find problems is yes. really a fundamental skill of it, right? Because you, when you've uncovered a problem, it's now this opportunity to make your game better. It's yes. not a condemnation of you as a human being. <laughs> it's not that you, anything, and that's, and then, and breaking those two, two things apart, I actually advise people to, uh, when they're taking in play test data, treat it as though somebody else made that game. Right, you're just trying to evaluate stuff as though some alien designer was actually involved and you can then look at it from that different angle and then be able to bring new ideas to it and then be able to try to solve it because separating ego from outcome yeah. uh, is, is a really critical part of the creative process. And be, and be careful not to change the entire thing because of one test, right? Yes. Because the, the inclination is to go, well, let me go 180 on this thing. Do not, do, small, small changes would be the best plan. You know, yeah. unless it's I mean, unless you could tell yourself that it's broken and it needs an entire core change, I wouldn't go rushing to do that. Right. Well, it's a it's a devil you know and devil you don't problem, right? Because very often when you see the problems in your game and you need to like, oh, there's all these things wrong with it, and you could sort of work on fixing them. Or if you do this wholesale change, it may seem like it's going to solve the problems, but it's also going to introduce this whole slate of new problems that you have no idea yeah. about right now. And so I actually tend to think about it in in chunks, right? When you're early in the process, I encourage like big moves, like a big swings of just like, all right, you don't know where the fun is yet. Try a bunch of big stuff, make some big changes, see where you land. And then once you've got something that you're like, okay, this is the heart of it, then smaller and smaller and smaller changes and like little bits of refinements until you get to the very end and you're just like right. tweaking the wording of cards or, you know, specific little things. And so yeah. you know, it's like fun all process. Of and it's, that is, that also brings a very, up a very good point. People tend to dwell on all of the, well, they hated this, they didn't like this and, and, I mean, or at least I okay I do, um, but I I try to remember especially the, so the finding the fun, the, those moments whether they were intentional or they messed up the rules whatever or you said you know what do this on the fly and it actually worked out, and somebody has a giggle fit or there's a big emotional reaction. Hold on to those friends. <laughs> Hold on to them. <laughs> Keep them close. Remember those too. Remember what it was that made that happen and how, how can you push that further? And then on the flip side, if you do have a, a play test and through the all the feedback you're getting, you're still muddled and you can't figure a way out of that, that the problems that the game has given you and that play test has given you and you can't figure it out, that can get pretty down, like that can be pretty crappy. My, my thought and my process for that is I move on to a di different game and I may revisit that game in the future because I'll have a different light or a different perspective on it. Uh, but if I don't want to get too down on a game, um, so I'll move on to other games and, and, and think about that. And that's true. And there's been some games I've shelved that I've never gone back to. And there's some games I've shelved and I've like thought about it again. I'm like, wait, maybe if we did this, that could work. And it does sometimes. Yep. Yep. I had my, uh, my game uh, Ringmaster I launched uh, two years ago. It was a decade that I kept putting. And it's just a simple little card game. And I just couldn't solve it, couldn't solve it, put it away, tried it out again, put it out, put it away. And finally, like the puzzle pieces all came together. So you never Perfect. know. And having that, 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 you know, back catalog of designs and keeping working on stuff, I think is also really powerful. All right, we're getting close to the end of the time that we have. So I want to ask one more big question here, and then we'll do, we'll do a final round, which is we're getting near the end. How do you know when you're done? How do you know never, when you're done? Testing? How do you know? <laughs> Y'all Jeff tells games. me I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really when you say so. Um, I think people already mentioned a couple couple times where it's like it's never done. Uh, I so many of these games that I've worked on behind me. There's so much stuff I would still change, but I think you really just have to uh, kind of pay attention to the feedback that people are giving you if it starts coming like very parse, like you know, uh, you know, and, and maybe inconsistent and stuff and. Uh, you know, you're, you're happy kind of with where things are and the fun that your game provides, then you're like, cool, done. You know, I, I think it also kind of depends on the interest of your game. If this is something that you're, you know, self-publishing, you kind of have the, the uh, uh, authority to say when it's done and when you're yes. ready to, to publish it. But if you have like a publisher that says like, I'll take it now, that kind of gives you a good, uh, um, yeah, it yeah. gives you a good sign that it's done. Although, even even me with a, a, a game that got uh, signed with a publisher, you still are working on it, you know, kind of through up until the point, even past the Kickstarter, just trying to get some things <laughs> right. So, mm -hmm. but that is a good point. It's based on the uh, convention season. Like, oh, Gen Con is next week. That my, my game is done, I guess, because I'm going to be pitching it next week at Gen Con, for example. So you, you yeah. that's that's when, you know, obviously, as long as you feel comfortable with it enough, but that's that's the game you're pitching by the time the conventions yeah. come. 
Well, yeah, this is my one of my mantras. I repeat uh, to all my students as well. Deadlines are magic. Mm -hmm. You have to have deadlines because everybody here, you can say, no, I don't know. I'm never done. I'm never done. You know when you're done? If you're, 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 you have a contract that says you have to deliver on this date. Mm -hmm. You have a convention and a pitch date that you've got to pitch on this date. You have a definitive, okay, we're going to print here, right? Mm -hmm. Those things. Yeah. So for a lot of people that are kind of maybe listening to this and aren't professionals yet, uh, you got to treat yourself like a professional. You've got to give yourself deadlines. You've got to give yourself real things and ideally make them public. That's where having going to a convention or having a pitch session scheduled yes. or having even a play test date, you know, where you get your friends are getting together to play test in two weeks, you better have a prototype ready or you're going to be embarrassed, right? Those things are really, really powerful tools because yeah, the games, you could work on them forever. You can iterate on them forever. You can play this them forever. And the difference between, you know, an amateur designer and professional designer is somebody that actually meets deadlines and gets it done. So really important. Yeah. Um, I, that is, you know, we are a company, so everything is done using, uh, organizers so we have uh jira and set up in a kanban you know like here's your checklist here's what i'm working on currently here's what's finished but with the and with us two week sprints so that i have to be realistic about what my t every two weeks did you complete your tasks and that has i mean that has done incredible things for my self-awareness of what i can accomplish in a, a certain period of time but it also is done incredible things for me to be realistic about what my goals are for what is finished. And I will say the hardest thing designing games internally is if I'm the designer on a game, I cannot be the developer. I'm not allowed, once I hand it off, I can't do as much because I then start, and the same thing. So Zach is a noodler until the end of time. like he will be dead yeah. and still being like but wait there's this one other like so once it gets handed off to somebody else there are some internally because that's a challenge in our company you're the designer or you're the developer and this developer you can start doing this fine tuning but not the designer because we are all just too invested in our own personal wouldn't it be cool if kind of moments yeah oh my god yes but um i think when i hear pitches too there's two particular red flags that like stick out if i'm talking to i always ask at a so let's say at a, at a pitch session where a bunch of people are like how long have you been working on this game because then i get a well you know i just made it last week or i get you know i've been at this game for seven years and those two things make me go hold on a second if you've been doing it for seven years which is legit maybe uh, or are you noodling forever and you haven't decided and so forth? But if you say, oh, I've, you know, I just made it. I'm like, you have not done, you have not been out there with different groups and all sorts of stuff. And so games, uh, board games, in my opinion, cannot be devved even in like, I mean, six months is small card game. And then year to year is, is sometimes what it takes for a bigger game. So uh, but but it, but I only look at the ends at first just to see if this flag is kicking and then I dive in and go, OK, like, are, you know, where are you at? You know, how baked is it? All right. So takeaway lesson, if you're pitching to Peter, lie about how long you've been developing your game. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I do a kind of a very so when we, we both design internally and sign out externally. And mine is how finished do you think this is? <laughs> Ooh. Oh, that's a tough one. That's a. I'm that's, so mean about it too, because so then mean. I will play it, and then I'll be like, "So really, it's not." Uh, so. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's tough. Yeah. So my my general metric for like when I think something is done is I uh, I have play testers that are asking to play independently. Ooh, nice. That like if if people want to play when I'm not prompting them and they want oh I want to play again I want to play again like that's my flag of like okay it may not be done done but it's now it should be moving towards a clear deadline um, before that yeah. I will I will keep iterating until clean the up that rule book yeah exactly exactly <laughs> that, that uh, that's a great point right there because I was testing the game we're doomed and people would say like. I was like, it's not done. And they'd be like, can we play that? Can we play that again? I was like, okay, well, maybe it is kind of done, actually. Because yeah. <laughs> it's, you know what, you like it just like this and you buy it right now. All right. Yeah, let your playtesters tell you. Uh, that's a, it's it's really valuable. They speak they speak with actions much more than than with words. Like I said, my mom loves all my games. She still doesn't actually know how to play them, but <laughs> um, 
All right, so uh, we are out of time, but I know that all of you have not only done amazing uh, sharing your knowledge and useful things here, but you also have other ways that people can reach you and things that they can do to share knowledge and things that they can learn from, like say maybe a journal or something, I don't know. But why don't we uh, go around and uh, have everybody just sort of say, if people wanna learn more from you or if you have any cool things to pitch or things that might be helpful, uh, you can kind of say that and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. So Peter, why don't you kick us off? Sure, and actually, since I didn't mention my company at the beginning, I'll say that I, I I work for Cardboard Alchemy. It is a small indie publisher that I just formed with a good friend of mine, Brad Brooks, and we uh, make some fun Kickstarters. We had one on on Kickstarter last year called Mission Catastrophe. Uh, Cardboard Alchemy is on all the platforms. We have, we do have our own Discord, but since just to make it easy, if you go to cardboardalchemy.com or usually CB Alchemy on Twitter and Instagram. We are out there sharing our, we believe in um, deluxe Kickstarter games with very pretty art. That's sort of our shtick. So if, if you like games that look good and play good, that's what we're about at Cardboard Alchemy. All right. I like it. All right, Nicole. Yeah, so you can find out more information about uh, games that I work on and games that uh, my whole other team works on too at funkogames.com. Uh, I feel like I have to give a shout out to the It's a Small World game that actually just dropped, I want to say a couple of weeks ago, just in time to be at Disneyland for the reopening. So it was a big oh, accomplishment cool. by the full team. And it's uh, definitely jumped up to the top of the list of my favorite games that I've worked on. If you open the box, does it play the song? No, no. Okay. That, that's one of everyone's right. first questions. Is there <laughs> like, right. is there audio included? No, there's not. No, there's not. <laughs> okay, Don't have to worry about it. that. Yeah. But it's plenty, it's plenty shiny. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what the uh, uh, draw is there. <laughs> and it's for kids. So I, um, uh, I love uh, uh, this new kind of work that I've been doing, uh, making games for like uh, kids and families, kind of introducing a new wave of uh, gamers uh, uh, to the for, you know, future uh, hobby. And um, yeah, so FunkoGames.com. You can also find me on Twitter at uh, N. Uh, Jack Itch, and then uh, if you're an indie designer looking to connect uh, at Playtest NW uh, for Playtest Northwest, you can find us there, find us on Discord um, to get people to test your game. Fantastic. Jay, you don't have anything you want to uh, share, do you? <laughs> I, uh, I actually designed something that's relevant to this uh, session is uh, actually the Fail Faster Playtesting Journal. And so this is a journal that actually guides you to take the notes you need to take uh, to help be a better playtester. Uh, and there's different information in every page and different tips. And I even gamified the process. So I've identified the behaviors that you need to have to be a good play tester. And as you go up on these things, you get badges. And when you get badges, you actually get a sticker and you get to put it on the front of your uh, book. And it's yeah. really, really cool. It's wow. really cool. That's awesome. Uh, failfaster.ca is where you can find more information about that. And me. Great. Julie. Yes. Uh, Greenbrier Games is where you can find everything we do uh, and our games are either one of two categories thematic dark horror lots of words rpg style tabletop or cute and stabby uh, <laughs> so if you have a game that's one of those two there's actually on our website uh, guidelines of what we're looking for to help you out if you think your game is the right fit we're happy to hear from you and um yeah that's that's it Great, and I'll uh, I'll do my own little pitch here. So obviously, if you're interested in uh, the games like Stoneblade makes, uh, then uh, Soulforge Fusion is coming to Kickstarter soon. It's a game I've co-created with Richard Garfield, who you may have heard of. Uh, he Thanks. we are making the world's first hybrid deck building game with entirely algorithmically generated unique cards that you can smash together to form your decks. It's very exciting and more details are coming. Um, and for those of you that want to know more about game design, I both wrote a book called Think Like a Game Designer, as well as a podcast where I interview many awesome people like those on this panel uh, to learn the universal principles. Uh, both those can be found at thinklikegamedesigner.com. And you can also sign up to join one of our live classes where we actually can learn and do mastermind groups and we can be on calls together. And you actually have accountability and community, all the things we've been talking about to help get your games done. All that can be found at thinklikegamesletter.com. I want to thank all of our panel. I think this is great stuff. I know I was taking notes here and I'm definitely going to be using some of the lessons. Uh, so hopefully everybody else got the value out of it. Thank you all for your time. And uh, hopefully we get to do this kind of conversation again soon, maybe in real life, not in just the Zoom world. There you go. Maybe at a real Yay. convention sometime yeah. soon. All right. Thank you, everybody. All right. Cheers.